Hello, I'm Philip Michael Thomas, and welcome to Treasure. You know, the Spanish get credit for discovering the new world, but they also looted its fabulous wealth. Then they'd ship the treasure back to Spain on galleons. Frequently overloaded, these vessels often sank in the waters of the Spanish main. The Nuestra Señora de las Maravillas was one such ship. We're going to join an expedition in search of her valuable cargo, which includes a five-foot solid gold statue of the Madonna and Child, as well as a 400-pound gold table encrusted with emeralds. Stay tuned. The Maravilla was flagship for a rich Spanish fleet, a 650-ton ship armed with 58 cannons. She carried 450 passengers. She had gathered riches from the New World and was returning to Spain, dangerously overloaded with treasure and cargo. The gold and precious jewels were carried in the captain's cabin in this area. The entire keel area, which was generally full of river rocks used as ballast, the river rocks were thrown out and silver ingots were put in the entire area here. This is where the valuable cargo was carried. This silver today would be worth in excess of $1.2 billion. Riches worth risking one's life for in the perilous journey ahead. The return trip to Spain was the most difficult part of the galleon's voyage. For a sea-weary vessel, the longest leg in the journey was the passage through the Indies. Navigating techniques were poor, and it faced 3,000 square miles of shallow reefs through the Bahama Banks. In 1655, Maravilla was on a voyage to the Spanish Main to take the riches of the Indies back to the mother country. On January the 4th, 1656, even though they had been advised not to sail, and there was bad weather, she did sail via what is now the present-day Bahama Islands to the horse latitudes where she was to change course and go to Spain. She was struck violently on the starboard bow by the Capitana that was on a reciprocal course, and she sank. One of the greatest treasures known to man was lost for the next 333 years. The Maravilla was the second richest shipwreck ever lost in the Western Hemisphere. She carried five and a half million pesos silver and gold on board. This is equal to approximately one and a half billion U.S. dollars today. She sunk in an area of the world that we were familiar with in water that was shallow enough to work. And we had done research and thought we could find the ship. In 1986, Captain Humphreys negotiated a contract with the government of the Bahamas for salvage rights to a 160 square mile area. Even today, pirates pose a threat to modern day treasure hunters. The Bahamas Defense Force would guarantee protection of his ship, the Beacon, in exchange for 20% of everything recovered. Humphreys knew the Maravilla's bow section could be found, but the main section and the mother load was another question. This was his goal. Yeah, this is the Air Quebec Beacon. Good morning, Art. How are you? Captain Humphreys enlisted the help of 30-year treasure hunter Art Hartman and his ship, the Dare. If we're lucky, two to three years. And uh, you have to realize that the water is very deep. It's a lot of sand to move. It just, it's, it's gonna be a very, very hard, tough project, but it will be worth it. Humphrey's ultimate goal was to locate the main section of the Maravillas, which allegedly broke off from the bow and drifted away. This section reputedly held a life-size gold statue of the Madonna and Child, a 400-pound gold table encrusted with diamonds, and 200 tons of silver bars. That was a 650-ton vessel. Probably some of the most elite people, their possessions would, would probably overcome what the king was carrying. Hardly any of the of the uh, personal belongings was found so far. From their research, Humphreys and Hartman knew that Spanish salvagers in 1677 found the bow section and brought up three and a half tons of silver. But despite that loss in treasure, Humphreys and Hartman knew that the mother load in the stern remained untouched. 
this goes back, I've got them going back to uh, 1583, second edition. New charts I got on this thing here, and I see once again, Maravilla. Even with the help of 17th century maps and charts, there would be few clues to follow without the help of modern day technology. The crew scanned the ocean floor for days with an instrument called a magnetometer. Uh, well, the magnetometer, you know, is an instrument that we have to track these ships with. Uh, you had to read uh, 200 feet under the sand. And the Maravilla scattered, you know, well over uh, five, maybe 10 miles. So without this instrument here, you're just up the creek. We just, we just, we just got to do this day after day after day. It's very boring, but it's, we get it done. Magnetometers were invented during World War II primarily to detect enemy submarines. They measured the intensity and variations of the Earth's magnetic field. Concentrations of iron in the ocean sediment can create these variations. Salvagers call them anomalies. But what they mean is the possible discovery of an anchor, cannon, or pile of nails, and most certainly a clue to the shipwreck. When the sensing probe gets a hit, a buoy with cement block and line is thrown out to mark the anomaly. The magging process is simple and methodical. Scan in a chosen area in 20-foot passes. Entire 12-hour days can pass without a flicker from the magnetometer's needle, but each hit, regardless of the strength, is checked out. And divers go down for a closer look with a metal detector. It's been said that treasure hunters are always eager and optimistic in the morning, exhausted and pessimistic in late afternoon. On this day, Art's hopes run high. Yesterday when we were magging here, uh, where those uh, group of buoys there is over there, is, is the main hit. <clears throat> I tried it, <clears throat> get it so you can get in between of them without catching the, uh, in the uh, wheels. Are you getting off the steep sand or not, huh? I have no idea. I never went down there. I was dragging a magdal right on the bottom. Right. I would have to think that's it's an anchor or maybe a couple cans laying there. It's a one heck of a lot of anomaly. Not only that, you see that other buoy way out there? See, that's towards that reef. Now, all through there, between here and that buoy over there, I got a lot of little light readings. There's, there's some stuff in there. During the summer of 1986, the ship's crew found the bow section of the Maravilla. Scattered among the ballast pile were gun barrels, bits of china, and enough pieces of eight to keep them coming back for more. We first found the Maravilla in June 1986 after towing a magnetometer over where we thought we should be looking for many weeks. The bottom there is entirely covered by sand to a depth of 20 feet. The beacon is equipped with blowers called mailboxes to blast through deep layers of sand. They're attached to the ship's transom so that the wash of the propeller is forced into the tube and deflected to the sea bottom. This is the beacon's main excavating tool. It can blast through 20 feet of sand and 50 feet of water within 30 minutes, blowing centuries of sand from the ocean floor to uncover the treasure lying below. In 1987, the mags had a hit that knocked the needle off the ground. And there lay the reason, the Maravilla's main anchor. Even with this major find, they couldn't pinpoint the main section. Perhaps the anchor lay far from the main body of the ship. Well, it could be anywhere over two miles. It could be four miles it could be as much as uh, five or eight miles away from here which way it went we got an idea uh, from what we've done so far but uh, out here you just look around where do you look at you know it's a lot of ocean out here uh, but we will we will find it it's here we will find it
Humphreys gave a computer expert all the known facts on the Maravilla. Weather conditions at the sinking, prevailing winds, and depth. He came up with some new possibilities. For the divers, it meant a new location, a new promise of treasure. The hunt was on. Oh, it was a great experience. Of course, the real, the real pleasure is not in finding the treasure, it's in the hunt. The whole idea that it's in our sight out here that you're looking at billions of dollars, uh, you know, that is there. You know, every time we go down, we bring up a little something. When the ocean bottom is swirling, much of treasure is uncovered. And that's the lure of a treasure galleon. Chewed by sea worms, lost in shape, timber could indicate anything. Beams can float away from the main section. They're but another piece of the puzzle. Uh, it's a pin going through some wood. Underneath this wood, and uh, the head of the bolt, or the pin with a washer around it, maybe. Much of the treasure suggests life on board the Maravilla. Belongings of the wealthy and the working class. Pieces of everyday life in the mid-17th century. Insights and small understandings of another place and time. Brass buttons, china, porcelain, a gold ring. All of this indicated a style and taste in the mid-17th century. Just like the clay pipes I just brought up about 10 minutes ago. You know, people collect things like that. And uh, it's like a Van Gogh or a Rembrandt or a original uh, Mozart symphony. You know, uh, these are the things that have value every bit as much as the uh, gold and the silver. That's pretty old. See how black it is? There might be some coins inside of that. There very well be some coins in there. The untrained eye might dismiss the chunk of conglomerate and the silver coins it holds. Now blackened by three centuries in salt water, this chunk could yield a handful of silver. On board the beacon, preservationist René Charette handles the artifacts as they're discovered. Some need simple cleaning, others a longer electrolysis treatment to remove the salt from a metallic structure. Still others need a soaking in fresh water. Through an assortment of chemical treatments, each piece will be brought back to life in an air environment. Yeah, that's a piece of bait, 330 years old. Oh. Silver and iron need an electrolysis bath to remove their salts. A blackened coin can return to shiny silver within 36 hours. An anchor may take up to two years. A lot of the treasure that was taken from the Maravilla, such as gold and jewels, was contraband that was being smuggled back. The Spanish crown levied a 20% tax on all proceeds carried back from the New World. Even though the laws were tough, smuggling was common. For that reason, Humphreys knew that the Maravilla carried untold treasure. As new holes were blown, they began finding green stones scattered among the debris, resembling uncut glass. These were emeralds from Colombia, the highest quality of the time. some pre previous uh, holes and some emeralds like these, a bunch of these, and uh, I was just getting ready to leave this last hole, and I caught a, a glimpse of a real big green emerald down there, and I just barely got to it before it rolled out of the hole, and I brought it back up to the deck of the boat, and everybody was jubilant, and we were happy, and great uh, morale booster for everybody. You know, turned out to be later, it'd be 100.85 carats. We're very happy to find it, and very lucky. From time to time, the emeralds were worshiped by different cultures credited with curing dysentery, preserving chastity, driving away evil spirits, and even assisting in childbirth. 
On August 16, 1987, the expedition had a day of emeralds. One chunk of coral and calcite yielded 42 emeralds, 10 of them over 30 carats each. By sifting sand with airlifts, the divers caught the heavier objects, hoping for a few more gems. They believed the conglomerate had once been the leather pouch of a wealthy passenger. More silver coins would appear, some minted, some cut from the cob, then one discovery that needed no guesswork, gold. I've heard of gold fever, but I never, never saw it before, and it was incredible, just incredible. Even the cook who you're speaking to was in the water quickly. <laughs> I mean, we all went diving right then. It was just great. And of course, right behind that, another gold bar, uh, and then the, the, the emeralds, the jewelry, and everything. Apparently, we had just hit a, a, a little cache of, of uh, really beautiful stuff. And the enthusiasm that that generated was just uh, it, it was remarkable. Just after days and weeks of out there just digging holes and looking and not finding anything really to mount anything, one piece of gold just galvanized everybody. And uh, it, it was an experience like none I've ever had in my life. Just marvelous. The 1988 season was the summer of gold. They found a four pound bar, a pendant from a knight of the Order of Santiago, jewelry in almost perfect condition. The crew was flying high. The most exciting thing I think we ever done was to work on the Maravilla. And to be able to work on this particular ship with the type of people that are associated with Humphreys, it's really a pleasure. Each crewman has another life and job somewhere else in the world. But here on the ship, life is simplified, focused on the hunt. After months of working on a ship with a select group of crewmen, camaraderie is another treasure without value. They dive, search for artifacts, eat, sleep, get up and do it again for three or four months at a stretch. They found the type of companionship people only know when sharing a goal. For each discovery, their mood swells in sync. When nothing turns up, they turn to the routine work of the beacon to pass the days. All of them a part of the adventure. The summer of 1988-89 came to a close without finding the Madonna and child, the 400-pound table encrusted with diamonds and emeralds, or the 200 tons of silver bars. But the Maravilla had not been stingy. She had relinquished millions in gold, silver, and historical artifacts. Humphrey still expects to find the stern of the ship. Each expedition has been getting more and more exciting as the artifacts they find get more and more valuable. He feels they're on a scattered pattern trail that will eventually lead them to the stern where the mother load was stored in the captain's cabin. In the meantime, Humphrey's share of the treasure is being displayed at the Cayman Maritime and Treasure Museum in Grand Cayman. In front of me are a few samples of the vast amount of treasure we discovered on the Maravillas. We have gold coins, silver pieces of eight, uncut emeralds, silver nuggets, and of course, the beautiful, beautiful jewelry. A large emerald, this one weighing 100.85 carats, looks very much like a broken Heineken bottle. In the early days, we bypassed many, many of these, didn't even bother to pick them up because we thought they were just broken glass, only to find out they're worth an extremely large amount of money. An amethyst looks like a, a broken mirror or something of that sort. Silver nuggets or black pieces of cold. And here we've got 70 pounds of silver in one bar that can make thousands and thousands of pieces of eight. But there's one thing that's always pristine and looks exactly the way you would think it would, and that is gold, the noble metal. The Maravilla Project has been great fun and a fantastic adventure, but best of all, it's been enormously profitable.
The story of the Maravilla is one of the greatest treasure tales of all time. It demonstrates the tenacity of human spirit in the face of all odds, and I admit gives me a touch of treasure hunting fever too. Thanks for joining us. I'm Philip Michael Thomas for Treasure. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western International the world's largest independently owned and operated lodging chain.